Well, good evening, everybody, um, and good morning to many of you also. Um, welcome back to the Cerebral Blood Flow Virtual Seminar Series. Uh, my name is Dr. Caroline Rickards. I'm from the University of North Texas Health Science Centre, um, and I'm one of the uh, organisers of this seminar series together with Pat Brassard. Um, I'm very excited today to have a great series of speakers for our session. Um, we have Takashi Turumi uh, from Japan and Binu Thomas, who will be our featured speakers for this session. Um, and they'll actually be co-chairing this session as well. Um, and then we have some great trainee speakers as well um, in, the, in the second half of this session. So just before we get started, um, let me just go over a few uh, details about this seminar series. Um, many of you are already aware that we've been running this series um, uh, almost for a year now, actually, since July of last year. Um, this is our 2021 series, so please stay tuned for additional sessions um, as we move through this session, this series up until June of this year. Um, also, just a reminder, if you'd like to join the Cerebral Autoregulation Research Network, um, all the information's on this slide right here. Um, if you'd like to be a member, just please send me your, uh, your CV. And also you can visit the Carnet website, um, the address is shown right here. Um, in addition, um, I'd like to highlight our uh, annual meeting, which will be in April, so April 22nd to 24th. This is a virtual meeting. Um, it is free to attend, and you can go, if you go to the Carnet website, you can register um, and get access to all of the live presentations and also poster sessions that will be running um, over this three-day meeting at the end of April. Uh, just in terms of some details about uh, the session for today, um, I'd please keep your microphones on mute and your video off uh, throughout the session. Um, there will be time for questions at the end of each presentation, so if you'd like to post your questions in the chat and we will address those with each of the speakers at the end of their session or at the end of their presentation. Um, as always, this session will be recorded and posted on the Carnet website within the, within the next few days. Um, and we really thank you for your support of this seminar series. Okay, with that, I'm going to pass over to Binu Thomas, who will be introducing our first featured speaker, uh, Takashi Turumi. So Binu, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for uh, this fantastic uh, speaker series that you've organized. Uh, I see there's uh, more than 85 uh, participants here. So welcome everyone uh, to our uh, next uh, CBF special seminar series. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Takashi Tarumi here. Uh, he did his uh, master's and PhD from UT Austin in kinesiology. And then he uh, pursued his uh, postdoctoral fellowship with Dr. Rong Zhang at uh, the Institute of Exercise and Environmental Medicine. And um, now he is a senior researcher at the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology at uh, Tsukuba, Japan. And uh, with that, uh, I'll uh, pass the uh, uh, the baton over to uh, Dr. Tarumi. All right. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. And um, uh, we really also appreciate Karen and Pat for organizing and inviting us to present our data to audience around the world. Um, I think we have pretty big audience you know, across the world. So this is very exciting for us. <laughs> Um, so today, I and my colleagues, um, so Drs. Binu Thomas, Tsubasa Tomoto uh, from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, and Brittany from the Concordia University in Canada, we present, okay, the effect of aging and exercise on brain function, with the particular focus on neurocognitive and cerebrovascular functions. Uh, we will cover a wide range of contents on neurovascular function, and I hope you will uh, enjoy. Okay. All right, so the title of my presentation is Brain Aging and Aerobic Exercise, uh, Neurocognitive Effects and Cerebrovascular Function. Um, okay, I, I see some lines on the slide, but okay, let, let me just keep going, right? Okay, so I'm currently located in Japan and I'm uh, affiliated to uh, three of these institutes now. Um, all right. So as everyone knows, um, the population demographic is rapidly changing these days. Um, 
the number of older adults is rapidly increasing and the population of younger adults is uh, shrinking in some countries like Japan. Okay. Thanks to a medical advancement, uh, life expectancy has almost doubled over the last century. So, you know, this has brought us um, many positives, such as we can spend more time with loved ones, we have more time with family. But um, this also brought us some negatives, such as increased risk of disease, age-related chronic disease, like dementia. And that's something we are going to focus on today. <coughs> So dementia is generally a, a disease for older adults. And as you can see in this figure, uh, with uh, increasing age, as you age, the incidence of Alzheimer disease increases. Okay? Alzheimer disease is the most dominant type of dementia. And you know, its risk increases almost exponentially after 60 years old. So this is a little bit busy figure, but what this is showing is the uh, um, um, uh, these uh, triangle, circle, squares. These are the pharmacological agents under development in clinical trials. So you know it's really a, a challenging situation. Uh, we are trying to develop uh, the pharmaceutical companies trying to develop these agents, but. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have really a good news, and we currently do not have effective treatment uh, for curing this Alzheimer's disease. And these uh, clinical trials started targeting the preclinical stage, okay, for prevention. But you know, uh, taking drugs for prevention, you know, you need to think about you know risk and benefit ratio. Okay. On the other hand. Epidemiological evidence is showing that um, dementia may be prevented. So for example, this study, this study showed that um, if we could reduce these risk factors okay, by 25%, we may be able to reduce 30% uh, of AD cases, Alzheimer's disease cases in the future. And if you look at these risk factors, okay, this includes physical inactivity like exercise, also vascular risk factors like uh, midlife obesity, midlife hypertension, diabetes. Yeah. So if I summarize what I just went over in the uh, last few slides, yeah, so uh, we, can see, uh, we can see that the brain function goes down with aging, yeah? um, and it, it, it is maybe accelerated by sedentary uh, lifestyle. And this decreasing uh, brain function increases the risk of cognitive impairment and dementia. But there is epidemiological evidence suggesting that having physical lifestyle, having, having physically active lifestyle, we may be able to change this trajectory, okay, upward, so that you know we we may be able to reduce the risk of dementia in the later life. Also. Um, this upward shift of this brain function uh, could be mediated by improved cerebrovascular function. All right, so before I go to the, um, uh, the actual data I'm going to show you, okay, from the exercise studies we did um, in, in, in our lab, um, I'd like to go over a little more uh, background. So, uh, such as how does human brain change with age? Okay? And what should we target okay, in intervention studies? Um, all right, so cognitive function is probably first and most important okay, uh, to prevent dementia or cognitive impairment. And this, is, this figure is showing the relationship between the age and the cognitive performance. You may think that the cognitive performance just goes down with age. Yeah, well, that's, that's partly true, but um, it's, it's not really uh, true for all cognitive domains. Um, what is really affected okay, by aging is this uh, fluid intelligence. Okay? So this 
Fluid intelligence includes memory, executive function, logical problem solving skills. Okay, this, uh, this performance goes down uh, after 20s of age. On the other hand, crystallized intelligence, intelligence, such as vocabulary, general knowledge, okay, this performance is relatively spared until very old age. And in some, global intelligence goes down okay, after middle age. So what's happening to the uh, uh, brain structure while cognitive function is going down, right? Brain tissue volume is um, one of the important structural markers to know brain aging process. In this picture, in this figure, I'm just, I'm showing the uh, um, a data from two individuals, a uh, 20 year old male, 76 year old male. And these two individuals have no more cognitive function, not impaired or not demented. But you can obviously notice, okay, that um, this, the brain of old guy, brain of um, old guy has the uh, enlarged ventricles, uh, more space, okay, in the uh, cortex. And this tiny structure, hippocampus, responsible for memory and learning, this also shrinks. So you can see more spacing, right? So we have, we, in our lab, we had data from about uh, 250 subjects, okay? So I just decided to plot this total brain volume and hippocampal volume with age and want to show you, okay, how brain ages, okay? And what we see, is okay, this brain aging process is continuous, yeah? but it starts particularly after midlife, around 50 years or so. Yeah? And it's same for our hippocampal volume. Another important thing is there is substantial individual variability. I decided to include the brain of MCA patients, but you know, MCA patients um, also had brain atrophy, kind of similar to a cognitively normal adults. So you may think, okay, this variability coming may be coming from measurement error. But then, okay, we had a longitudinal scans. And if I look at the intra-class correlation for reliability, okay, so we have very high correlations. Okay, so it means, okay, so these uh, measurements are, are, are really true and not likely related to measurement error. Um, another feature of the uh, brain in older adults is white matter hyperintensities or white matter lesion. Yeah. So this is the um, a, a flare images. So it's a different contrast compared with the T1 weighted image I just showed you. Okay. And, but uh, taken from the same individuals. In the old guy, okay, uh, their brain starts developing this white matter hyperintensity. And these are uh, supposed to be related to a small uh, cerebral small vessel disease. And if I plot this, okay, again, in the same um, um, sample, you can see, okay, white matter hyperintensity really start developing after middle age. Okay, we have a, um, we had a, a little more sophisticated measurements for white matter fiber integrity assessment. Okay. Um, this measurement will come up a few times uh, in the later slides. So I like to give you a basic understanding. But basically this uh, white matter fiber integrity measured by TTI uh, this quantifies the diffusion of water in the axon fiber tract, okay? And, and let me just go over a little more detail, okay? So you, what you see here is a cross section of the brain and why matter axons are connecting the different areas of the, of, the, of the brain. So this facilitates the communication between neurons. And this DTI, measures the uh, diffusion of water in the, uh, in the brain tissue. So particularly in the white matter axons in this, in, this, in this case. And if you have healthy white matter fibers, the diffusion of water inside healthy white matter, healthy white matter fiber will be uh, highly directional. So this will give uh, 
higher fractional and anisotropy and lower mean diffusivity. But if you have damaged white matter fibers with holes, you know, or so, um, it, it's an extreme example, but if you have damaged white matter fibers, then water diffusion inside will be less directional and this provides uh, lower FA and high MD. So this is very good tool to assess uh, white matter integrity in the brain. And here are the uh, FA and MD images. You can see um, FA, FA image of all the uh, other guy shows more grayish color, grayish contrast. So the overall white matter fiber integrity is reduced. Also in MD image, you see more whitish color, whitish contrast. So the um, integrity is again uh, reduced. And if I plot this with age, with increasing age, um, global FA goes down progressively and MD goes up um, similarly. Uh, after 45 years or so. This is really, uh, I think, really uh, interesting data, at least I think. Um, so you may have heard of amyloid beta. Um, when you hear amyloid beta, you may think that, okay, amyloid beta is a pathological marker for Alzheimer's disease. Yes, that's, that's true. But A beta is also, um, um, a beta deposition is also affected by aging. As you can see in the MCA patients with increasing age, amyloid beta level increases progressively. And what's really interesting is that um, A beta level is also increased with age in cognitively normal adults. Okay. And this individual variability starts increasing after 50 or 55 years old but even in these individuals who have really high level of amyloid, okay, they have normal cognitive function. So what I like to highlight is there is a significant overlap okay, in this pathological process. And let me just summarize what I just went over um, uh, in the last few slides. So age-related decline in brain structure and function starts during middle age and progressively worsens in later life and shows substantial individual variability. And calling to be normal adults and MCA patients have significant overlap in their brain aging process. So we think that um, slowing or preventing this brain aging process may reduce the risk of dementia. This, um, take us to the, um, the second question. Uh, so can aerobic exercise prevent or slow brain aging to decrease the risk of dementia? And for this question, I'd like to uh, show you the results from two studies. One was the uh, randomized control trial in the amnesic MCA patients. Yeah. Um, and the uh, second study is a cross-sectional study in middle-aged healthy adults. So the, the intention for this study was that, okay, brain aging starts around the middle age. So if they're exercise training, can we change the trajectory of, uh, of this aging process? So let me start from the uh, start, uh, study one. And this is the, uh, basically the design of study. I'm not going to explain much detail of, uh, uh, of this figure, but basically, 70 MCA patients are randomized to stretching and toning group or aerobic exercise training group. Okay? And the primary outcome measurement was cognitive function. And we also had secondary, measure, secondary outcome measurements, including MRI and amyloid PET imaging. After one year, uh, about 70% of subjects completed the exercise training, um, either SAT or AET. And we performed the analysis on all of the subjects randomized based on the intent to treat principle. I'd like to give you some idea of what kind of exercise program we gave, okay, in the AET program. Uh, this was home-based and this uh, program uh, progressively increased the duration and intensity of exercise. Um, over six months, and after six months to 12 months, uh, we basically maintain the, uh, the exercise dose okay, for six months. 
So this exercise program was designed to improve the cardiorespiratory fitness. And as a result, okay, after one year, uh, we found that the okay, AEK group on average, uh, they significantly improved their peak VO2 com when compared with the SAT group. So this peak VO2 is a, is a gold standard measure of cardiorespiratory fitness. And compliance, the AT program was about 69%. We had 11 adverse events uh, overall uh, for the entire course, from the entire course of the study. Um, cognitive function measurement was the primary outcome for this study. We mainly focused on the memory and the executive function. And uh, like I shown in the previous slides, uh, memory and executive function are part of the fluid intelligence that uh, goes down with age. Um, but in this study, uh, what we found was, um, in general, um, SAT and AET groups both showed improvement in cognitive performance. So you see a significant time effect. We found some uh, interaction effects but um, the magnitude of change um, um, was relatively small. On the other hand, this is a result from the brain uh, imaging uh, uh, measurements. Yeah. Um, so basically we found the significant aging or time effect. Uh, what it means is that the total brain volume decreased over time, hippocampal volume also decreased over time, and white matter region volume increased over time. Amyloid deposition level did not change um, by time or by interaction. So after seeing these results, I was a, a little bit disappointed because, okay, I, I thought maybe we don't have any possible, uh, we, we do not have much possible result. But then if I look at the uh, DTI data, so DTI again measures the um, white matter integrity um, by looking at the fractional anisotropy and mean diffusivity. Um, if I do a group level analysis, I could not find um, AT or SAT programs improved or, uh, 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 or decreased white matter integrity. But if I do a voxel-wise regional um, analysis, I found that the improvement in VO2 max uh, was correlated with decreased mean diffusivity. And decreased mean diffusivity reflects better or improved white matter integrity. And so, these blue regions show the significant effect of VO2 max. But if I, okay, look at the anatomy of these regions, I found that, the, okay, these regions included the body of corpus callosum, right superior coronary theater, mm -hmm. and right superior longitudinal particulars, and genu of corpus callosum. And if I extract the individual values, okay, uh, from these voxels, I, I again confirmed okay, improved VO2 max was related to decreased mean diffusivity, which suggests improved white matter integrity. So aerobic exercise training, almost specifically aerobic fitness, may be important for white matter fiber integrity, um, even in the patients with uh, mild cognitive impairment. So let me move to the second study. So in this study, like I explained um, briefly in the last slide, uh, we did a cross-sectional cross -sectional study to compare young sedentary group, middle-aged sedentary group, and middle-aged athlete group. My intention, our intention was that, okay, maybe middle-aged um, aerobic exercise training can um, uh, negate, okay, the uh, age-related brain structure changes. Yeah? And this is a participant characteristics. But uh, our middle, so middle age in this study uh, was about 40, uh, 55, 54 years old. And um, as expected, we found that the VO2 max was significantly higher in the athlete group when compared with sedentary group, but it was even higher than young sedentary group. I like to note that um, these middle aged athletes had a history of physical activities for almost 25 years and they were aerobically training for 
10 hours per week at the time of study enrollment. So, you know, interpretation of this result may be slightly different from intervention studies, but, you know, we want to get uh, some hint, okay, from uh, uh, hint for the effect of exercise training in Middle Asia though. Again, um, I'm showing the result of the uh, diffusion tensor imaging. Um, so it's a white matter integrity. We found that, um, so this was a really interesting finding because the effect was really strong. Um, so this time I'm looking at the global white matter integrity um, compare uh, between these three groups. And we found that, um, so global white matter integrity affair, okay, was reduced in middle-aged sedentary, uh, middle sedentary adults compared with young sedentary adults. So this makes sense. It's just uh, age-related deterioration. But when it comes to the middle-aged athlete, we found that their FA value was significantly higher than their age-matched sedentary adults. And it was similar to young sedentary adults. And if I plot these individual data with age, we found that the FA goes down with age in sedentary adults, but uh, in middle-aged athletes, okay, FA was um, significantly elevated, and it looks like, okay, maybe trajectory was a little bit uh, shifted upward. We also had the uh, brain volume measurement. Um, more specifically, we measure the cortical thickness. Cortical thickness is a really sensitive measure um, to brain atrophy. And, but um, if I compare cortical thickness between these three groups, Basically, what we found was this uh, age-related cortical thinning was present in both middle-aged sedentary and uh, middle-aged athlete group. If I compare middle-aged sedentary athlete groups, we found only this uh, motor cortex, somewhat sensory cortex, and visual cortex. These cortical thickness were increased in athletes. So let me just briefly summarize what we just went over. So these findings um, from these studies suggest that the age to start and dose of aerobic exercise training may have significant impact on neurocognitive function and the aerobic fitness is possibly associated with white matter integrity, all the cognitive function and the other brain imaging measurement showed weak associations. All right, so let me now uh, move on to the, uh, the third question, which is, does vascular risk reduction contribute to neurocognitive improvement? But before, answer, before I answer this question, let me um, just briefly explain why we care about cerebral graph flow. Why is cerebral graph flow important for the brain? So the figure you are looking at is the uh, total basal, uh, uh, the bas basal metabolic rate, okay? by each organ, by, uh, uh, by organs uh, shown here. Under resting condition, the brain consumes about 17.8% of, uh, uh, of the total metabolic, total basal metabolic rate. Yeah? So this makes the brain one of the most metabolically active organs in the human body. Um, but if you look at this table, um, the energy stored in each of these organs is, uh, I mean, the energy stored in the brain is really low um, compared with the other organs like liver, muscle, and adipose tissue. So these, you know, liver, muscle, adipose tissue have some sort of energy storage, like glucose, triglyceride, or mobilizable proteins, but brain has a really small amount, okay? So for this reason, the um, brain has to depend on the cerebral blood flow uh, to get the energy for neuronal activity. As a result, brain receives about 15% of cardiac output while it only weighs 2% of body mass. To receive this amount of blood flow, 15% okay, of cardiac output, the cerebral vascular resistance has to be very low. Okay? And and up to 40% of the cerebral vascular resistance is controlled by the large cerebral arteries, which protect the distal microcirculation. So cerebral vascular resistance is low, but 
it cannot be over perfused, right? Because you know it can damage the capillaries. So resistance is controlled by the uh, large uh, cerebral arteries. Another important feature of cerebral circulation is, is that the CBF is really dynamic. So if you look at the, uh, okay, so this um, data um, shown in time domain, okay, cerebral blood flow velocity measured by Doppler um, is always changing, okay, in different time scales, okay, it's never static, okay. And if you convert this uh, time domain CBF data to frequency domain, and you see more, um, um, uh, more phenotype, okay? You see two peaks, okay? Um, you, you see the uh, CBF energy the, uh, um, is concentrated in the low frequency domain and also a cardiac frequency, yeah? At the low frequency, um, I think you know cerebral autoregulation and uh, that has been present in the seminar series many times, but um, cerebral autoregulation can buffer the effect of blood pressure on the CBF, okay? So you can see this, uh, this blood pressure changes is uh, buffered by autoregulation and you don't see much of the CBF change here. So uh, the brain works like a hypers filter system. So, um, slow fluctuation of blood pressure is a buffer. But the cardiac, at the cardiac frequency, uh, blood pressure is directly transmitted into the brain and you see a really high peak here at the cardiac frequency. So we want to see the effect of age on the slow fluctuation of cerebral blood flow. So to do that, we collected the um, um, continuous blood pressure and continuous um, cerebral blood flow velocity measurements using TCD for five minutes during repeated sit-stand maneuver. And these are the representative data um, during the uh, uh, during uh, sit-stand maneuvers. And you see this uh, fluctuation of blood pressure and the cerebral blood flow, okay, synchronized to each other. And if we look at the uh, group average data, compared between young, middle-aged, and older adults, we found that in older adults, yeah, CBF fluctuation is augmented at the sit-stand frequency yeah, for cerebral blood flow and blood pressure. But when we compare old sedentary adults and old masters athletes who do aerobic exercise training, yeah, we do not find the CBF fluctuation is different. So they are pretty similar. Um, for mean blood pressure, you look, it looks like there is a, some difference, but this was not statistically significant. Yeah? Um, dynamic cerebral autoregulation measures like transfer function gain phase coherence were similar between these uh, groups. And another important um, aspect of cerebral blood flow is a pulsatility. That's what I just mentioned in the last slide. Um, so pulsatility is affected by the cardiovascular, um, 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 uh, cardiovascular or, or pulse pressure. So basically blood pressure generated by the, by the heart. And it also the stiffness of central elastic arteries. Okay. Um, and what, I want, what I'm showing here is with increasing age, arterial stiffness or central arterial stiffness increases progressively with age. And as a result of this, pulse pressure also increases. And it has been hypothesized that um, increased aortic stiffness or increased arterial stiffness and pulse pressure will facilitate the transmission of this uh, pulsatility to the cerebral circulation. Yeah. So with this hypothesis as a background, we want to see, okay, what happened to the cerebral blood flow? And we measured cerebral blood, in this study, we measured cerebral blood flow using two different methods. One was the uh, phase contrast MRI. So this uh, MRI method 
gave us to uh, give us the measurement of uh, uh, total CBF by adding inter internal carotid arterial blood flow and vertebral arterial blood flow. Yeah? And this, because this PCMRI was not gated, okay, we also acquired the uh, transcranial Doppler to uh, obtain the waveform of cerebral blood flow velocity. But the main weakness of TCD is that it cannot measure diameter of the insulated artery or it cannot measure the flow. And this mean level of CBFB is individually different. Um, we decided to normalize this waveform by mean CBFB. So after normalization, um, all individuals have uh, same CBFB 100%. Then we compare these pulsatile uh, measurements. Then what we found okay, was first, with the increasing age, total CBF and mean CBFB uh, decreased with age. Okay? So these are consistent with the literature. These, these are reported by many papers. We also found that this mean CBFB measured by transcranial Doppler from the middle cerebral artery was significantly correlated with total CBF with R square of 0.31. So this suggests about 30% of variance is explained by each other. For CBF positivity measurement, we found that the progressive increase in CBF positivity after 40 years or so. This was accompanied by increased systolic CBF and um, decreased diastolic uh, cerebral blood flow. And in another paper, we found that this decreased diastolic cerebral blood flow is associated with reduced Weimata hyperin, reduced Weimata integrity. All right, so let me summarize what, uh, for, the, uh, for, the, from the, for the last several slides. So the fluctuation of CBF during posture change is augmented in older adults, but endurance athletes had a similar CBF fluctuation during posture changes to sedentary older adults. And age decreases total CBF while increasing its positivity, which may increase risk of neuronal tissue damage. Okay, so so far my presentation covered the effect of aging exercise on mainly on neurocognitive function and also some cerebrovascular function. But we still have some uh, remaining questions. So does aerobic exercise training alter CBF and positivity? And is aerobic fitness associated with cerebral basal motor reactivity? And these questions will be answered by, uh, by uh, next uh, speakers. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank the uh, people involved um, uh, for, for the studies I just presented, particularly uh, Ron Zhang, he, he is my uh, mentor from the uh, IEM. Um, thank you so much. I, I, okay, this is all I have. Please, Thank you so much for the uh, very nice presentation, Dr. Tarumi. We have uh, one question here posted in the chat. Uh, the question says, uh, uh, a question posted by Alexander uh, Razmovsky. Uh, what is the background of label total CBF by uh, measuring flow through ICA and VA and why do you call it total CBF? So why did I say total CBF? Is that what you mean? Is yeah, that yeah, mean? I think that's what it means. So why do you compute total CBF using the ICA and the VA alone? Um, so for, for this study, we, we want to see the overall change of CBF with aging. And um, we, we could go more detail with regional flow, but um, I like, I want to, give a more kind of general information that, okay, how does overall like global cerebral blood flow change with age, you know, along with the positivity. Um, yeah, so we, we, we could go more in detail to show regional flow, but um, yeah, that want to provide a little more kind of general information by uh, calculating total CBF. I don't know if I answered uh, his question, but that's that was my intention when we did this study. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Maybe we have time for one more quick question if there is any. If not, uh, we will just move ahead because we are uh, already over our time limits. 
Sorry, man. Okay, I see Nick Bray has raised their hand. Hi, Dr. Chirumi. Uh, great presentation. Uh, just wondering, I, I noticed at the start of your uh, presentation, you highlighted brain function. Um, so I thought you might uh, include measures of fMRI. Uh, and, I, and I know you included several measures of MRI, including PET. So, so I'm just wondering if there was any reason for excluding fMRI or were there just enough measures um, of brain imaging? Um, yeah. Was there any particular reason? We had some FRI measurement, um, but yeah, I, I guess I decided not to show that data. Or well, one reason is I, I guess um, I did not really work so much on the fMRI data. I did work some on fMRI, but also um, I, I guess it also depends on my interest. I was more interested in the structural measurement. Um, those functional measurements were, I thought, um, uh, it was a little bit. Um, prompt noise, I, I, I would say, and didn't show. Yeah, but um, yeah, my, my interest was more on the structural measurement, but we, we do have those fMRI data, yeah. No, no, I, I appreciate the honesty and uh, as someone that works on fMRI, I definitely know that it's prone to noise. So uh, yeah, thanks for that. Thank you. Okay, there's one more question uh, from Dr. Rosenberg. Uh, Thank you for the wonderful talk. I'm very interested in the effects of resistance exercise alone and combined with aerobic exercise on CBF and cognitive health with aging. Do you have any plans to look at resistance exercise? Okay, I do not have a specific plan yet, but um, so previous study has really looked at the resistance exercise and uh, no, no, aerobic exercise. And now um, I, I can see in the field, you know, uh, high intensity, like interval exercise training, uh, are getting more focused. But um, I, I can, I definitely agree with you. This it would be a very interesting question, you know, to see combined aerobic and resistance exercise. You know, actually, in, in this uh, randomized control trial, we had the uh, SAT condition. You know, SAT condition, they did a, in, in that condition, they did stretching, but they did also a light resistance exercise. And we found the increased cognitive performance in the SAT group as well. So, you know, resistance exercise may have some impact, you know, on cognitive function or cerebral vascular function. So, but I think that's definitely a, a good future question to look at. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tarumi, for the wonderful talk. I think we should proceed further. It's already 6.45. Yes, okay, all right. Thank you. So, okay. All right, so the next speaker will be um, um, Tsubasa Tomoto. Uh, he'll be talking about the effect of aerobic exercise training on cerebral graphro and arterial uh, uh, stiffness. Uh, he's from the Institute uh, for Exercise and Environmental Medicine in Dallas. And um, yeah, so please share your screen and start. Okay. I thank very much for giving me this great opportunity to talk about my research here. Hi, so my name is Tsubasa Tomoto, and I'm postdoc research fellow at the Institute for Exercise and Environment Medicine. So today, I would like to talk about the effect of one-year aerobic exercise training on central arterial stiffness and cerebral block flow in amenistic mild cognitive impairment. So in this study, I focus on to the patient with amenistic mild cognitive impairment who has a, a memory concern because they have a higher probability of developing Alzheimer's disease, which is a, one of the most common cause of dementia. So amenistic mild cognitive impairment is an intermediate stage between the expected, uh, expected cognitive decline of normal aging and Alzheimer's disease. So this is amnestic MCI phase here. So <clears throat> then recent, uh, recent studies have suggested that AMCI may represent an optimal stage for implementing preventive strategy that may delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease. So this figure shows the prog progression of cognitive impairment in x-axis and normal, uh, cognitive normal and mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease, and y-axis in pathway velocity, which is an index of arterial stiffness, 
which is the higher number indicate the more stiffer artery. So this figure suggests that greater artery stiffness is associated with progression of cognitive impairment. So recent, recently, our team reported uh, carotid stiffness independently associated with brain amyloid uh, beta accumulation, especially in the precutaneous region in patients with AMCI after adjust age, sex, blood pressure, and APOE4 status. So these findings provide the evidence that carotid arterial stiffening may contribute to Alzheimer's disease pathology in patients with MCI. So what is, uh, what is the physiological role of central arterial stiffness? So central arteries include large elastic arteries such as aorta and carotid arteries. Central arterial stiffness reflect the ability of arterial stiffness uh, arterial wall to expand and recall with each cardiac cycle and provide a wind cell effect. So elastic arteries effectively buffer the positive blood pressure and blood flow from the left ventricle and provide the less positive flow and make continuous flow at the end organs, such as the brain. However, stiffer artery impair the this, this buffering function and impair the wind castle effect and cause to increasing the artery pulsation at the end of organs. And this could be lead to a damage to the cerebral vascular and brain tissue damage. So how is arterial stiffness contributed to cerebral, uh, cerebral blood flow? So this is a proposed hypothesis based on the previous papers. Increased central arterial stiffness, increasing the pulsatile pressure and uh, increase the pulsatile cerebral blood flow. And this may lead, uh, this may cause to the cerebral vascular remodeling and increasing the vascular tone, which may uh, show the increasing the cerebral vascular resistance and decrease the cerebral blood flow this may be caused to decreasing the cognitive function, cognitive performance. So to investigate, to investigate this proposed hypothesis, we set up two research questions. Whether carotid arterial stiffness uh, is associated with reduced cerebral blood flow and increasing the cerebral vascular resistance uh, in the patient with MCI whether one-year aerobic exercise training, AET, reduce carotid arterial stiffness and increasing the cerebral blood flow in MCI. To address these questions, we conduct cross-sectional studies which compare the cognitive normal and MCI, uh, MCI group, and this uh, same MCI patient went to randomize into the a one-year aerobic exercise training or SAT uh, program. So this result is uh, reported in the previous publication. So I want to I would like to introduce uh, this cross-sectional study first. So I want to briefly explain the methodology of the main parameters which used in these studies. So normalize several block flow was calculated from total CBF divided by brain tissue mass. And cerebral vascular resistance was calculated by uh, mean arterial pressure divided by total cerebral block flow. So this total cerebral block flow measured a sum of block flow volume measured from bilateral internal carotid artery and vertebral arteries using this equation and brain tissue mass was calculated from brain tissue volume obtained from MRI and times 1.06 to convert to brain tissue mass. So carotid arterial stiffness was assessed by carotid arterial pressure using applanation tonometry and carotid arterial wall distension was assessed using the ultrasonography. 
coated arterial pressure was calibrated to brachial mean pressure and diastolic pressure. Distension of uh, distension was measured by obtaining the maximum diameter and a minimum diameter of common carotid arteries, 10 to 15 millimeter distal to the uh, distal to the carotid uh, bifurcation. And we use the carotid beta stiffness index as a index of central arterial stiffness. Pulsatile CVF and arterial pressures were simultaneously measured, and cerebral buffer velocity at middle of cerebral arteries was obtained by using the uh, transcranial Doppler. And normalized pulsatile CVF was calculated from pulsatile CVF divided by mean CVF. This uh, table shows the subject characteristics from cross-sectional study. No group difference in age, uh, year of education, and body mass index. To diagnose the MCI status, we use the clinical dementia rating, and all MCI uh, patients score 0 0.5 in this uh, test. MMSC scored similar between group, and as expected, uh, MCI group have a lower uh, logical memory immediate recall and delayed recall score. In hemodynamics, blood pressure was severe and pulsatile pos CVF was slightly higher in MCI and in we observed internal carotid artery blood flow, a total brain, uh, blood flow volume was significantly lower in MCI and total brain blood flow was lower, uh, significantly lower in MCI. Carotid beta stiffness was a 10 to higher in MCI, and normalized CPF was significantly lower in MCI, and cerebral vascular resistance was significantly higher in MCI group. Also, we observed stiffer carotid beta stiffness, stiffer artery have a lower normalized CPF, and carotid systolic pressure higher, uh, carotid systolic pressure was high associated with higher cerebral vascular resistance and higher carotid pulse pressure was associated with greater pulsatile uh, CVF. Importantly, so th these associations between normal CVF as arterial stiffness, uh, vascular resistance and carotid systolic pressure and pulsatile CVF and carotid pulse pressure was maintained significantly after controlling by age, sex, BMI, and MCI status. So these results suggest uh, arterial stiffness, carotid arterial stiffening may contribute at least in the part to reduce the uh, reduce CVF and increasing the CVR in MCI associated with augmented arterial pulsatility. The second research question was whether one year aerobic exercise training, AET, reduces carotid arterial stiffness and increasing the cerebral blood flow in MCI patients. So it is well known in older population compared with sedentary people People who regularly perform the aerobic exercise have you know, lower carotid arterial stiffness, and moreover, greater aerobic capacity is associated with less carotid artery. So, therefore, exercise improves carotid arterial stiffness may increasing cerebral blood flow. So, we perform the exercise intervention group uh, intervention study, which Dr. Tarmi already explained. So this table shows the subject characteristics uh, in this longitudinal study. There is no group difference in uh, in MMSC score and uh, memory recall score and body composition. So this also, Dr. Tarmi explained detail about 
this uh, exercise training uh, program previously. So this table shows the system hemodynamics and VO2 uh, max, uh, VO2 peak change. So to investigate the effect of aerobic exercise training, we use a linear mix model to analyze the effect of a time, group, and interaction. So systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure was a lower uh, decrease in both groups. And VO2 peak was improving in AET group at six months and 12 months compared with baseline. And we observed the interaction in the internal carotid arterial block flow volume and cerebral vascular resistance is decreasing in both groups. And brain tissue mass we slight, uh, we do see the time effect. This is a uh, aging effect. So normalized CVF was significantly increasing the aerobic exercise training group compared to baseline. This is about a 3.6% uh, increase and uh, from baseline. The carotid beta stiffness was significantly decreasing in AET group at six months, 12 months compared to baseline and AET groups. And pulsatile CBF was significantly lower in AET group at 12 months compared with baseline and uh, SAT group. So this figure shows the association of individual changes after one year uh, intervention. Improved VO2 peak was associated with increasing normalized CBF and also decreasing the carotid beta stiffness and decreasing the pulsatile CBF. So we performed a mediation analysis to assess these physiological relationships. So we observed the improving VO2 peak was associated with increasing the normalized CBF. So based on the previous observation, we add carotid beta stiffness and positive CBF in this mediation model. So improving VO2 peak was associated with decreasing the carotid beta stiffness and decreasing the carotid beta stiffness was associated with decreasing the positive CBF and decreasing the CBF was associated with increasing the normalized CBF. And after, so after adding these two pathway, uh, this pathway, uh, association between uh, VO2 peak and normalized CBF was no longer significant. Also, this significant pathway, VO2, carotid beta stiffness, positive CBF, and normalized CBF, was confirmed with using a bootstrapping assessment and 95, 95 confidence interval not across zero is also indicating the significant pathway. Therefore, this positive changing in VO2 peak and normalized CBF was mediated by carotid stiffness and positive CBF. In this study, we also observed the association between arterial stiffness and cognitive performance. Arterial stiffness measured by Carotid femoral pathway velocity was associated with lateral frequency score. So decreasing the arterial stiffness was associating with increasing the this score. Also, carotid IMT in this region here was associated with a, a increasing the IMT thickness was associated with decreasing the color word inhibition score. So one year, one year aerobic exercise training reduced the central arterial stiffness in the carotid artery and decreased the pulsatile CBF and decreasing the cerebral vascular resistance, then increasing the cerebral blood flow. So then uh, association between cerebral blood flow and cognitive performance will be a mention by next presentation, uh, presenter, Dr. Thomas.
thank you very much for giving me this great opportunity. All right, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Tsubasa Tomato, for presenting uh, a very interesting data on the effect of exercise on arterial stiffness and CBF. Um, so, is there any question from audience? Um, I think you can raise your hand and speak up, or maybe you can type in, in the chat. Um, so, uh, all right, so if there is no question, maybe let me ask uh, one question to uh, Tsubasa. So in the intervention um, study, you, you found that the ICA blood flow, I think, increased in the AET group, uh, but the, there was no change in the uh, VA flow. Um, do you think if there is any potential explanation for the regional difference? In the previous paper, uh published about, uh, they reported about the uh, MCI patient have significantly lower in MC, uh, ICA for us, uh, in, internal carotid artery block flow. So I think is when you, uh, basically when you decrease the block flow, it mainly comes from uh, the ICA, VA will be maintained. Mm -hmm. Also the brain, the ICA is provide the block, block flow to the more anterior or like a, to the like uh, the side to the brain, which is kind of like a lot of like important function there. That's why I think it's and also like motor cortex. So when if you do the exercise, then ICA can be provide more flow to the vision. Okay, all right. Um, thank you so much for the answer. And um, I don't. Why is aortic stiffness? appears to be less sensitive to aerobic exercise training than the current question by Wesley Lefferts. I think uh, analyzing this, I mean, we also measure the CFPWB and CFPWB is very sensitive. Uh, they have a like, correlation between the arterial pressure change. So when we analyze the data, then I do see the correlation with, since like this post uh, AT, SAT group decrease in the pop, uh, the actual stiffness. So it's, uh, we do see the both like uh, improving in both groups, CFPWB, but like uh, uh, the carotid beta stiffness is, we can like remove that, uh, take off the effect of blood pressure. So I think it can be the more, like a little bit more detail about the actual stiffness. Okay. All right, thank you so much. And I thank you so much for the questions and, and also the answers by uh, Tsubasa. All right, so because uh, the, the time is running, so we need to, uh, we want to go to the uh, next talk. The next talk will be uh, uh, another feature talk. Uh, it'll be given by Dr. Binu Thomas. Um, um, Binu uh, received uh, the master's and PhD degrees in biomedical engineering um, uh, from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, and he did a postdoc at the uh, University of uh, Texas uh, at Dallas. Um, all right, so whenever you're ready, uh, Binu, please uh, start. Okay, can you hear me fine and see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Taka, for the introduction. Uh, my topic today for the talk is uh, assessment of brain function, deterioration, and effects of exercise intervention in MCI using cerebral blood flow, CMRO2, and CVR2 CO2 inhalation. And I'm an assistant professor at the Advanced Imaging Research Center and uh, uh, radiology. Okay, so uh, basically I will go over two talks, uh, two sets of projects today. Uh, first one is to assess brain function in MCI and compare it to age-matched healthy controls. Uh, the next one is to uh, uh, look at the clinical trial uh, to assess the benefits of 12 months of aerobic exercise training in brain function in MCI participants. So uh, it's, uh, everyone probably is already aware of in this group that clinical trials and anti-amyloid strategies um, uh, in, in prevention of Alzheimer's disease have, have failed, largely failed. Uh, and so the, uh, the uh, notion is that uh, early detection of Alzheimer's disease uh, will 
uh, with uh, with trying to uh, add some intervention to at this stage will benefit the uh, the uh, the patients in the long run uh, to prevent Alzheimer's disease. Um, so the very early one of the early stages of Alzheimer's disease is the amnestic mild cognitive impairment. It is characterized with a clinical dementia rating score of 0.5, and uh, typically marked with mild memory impairment. Many mental uh, state exam scores are also normal. So clinical diagnosis is pretty challenging and there are no clear biomarkers to detect these abnormalities. So we used, uh, decided to use uh, three different MRI modalities uh, to measure, uh, to, to characterize some biomarkers in MCI. First, we measured the energy budget or the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen consumption in the brain. Uh, given that this is just a regional measure, or, or sorry, a, a global measure, that is you get one value for the entire brain for one subject, uh, we decided to measure uh, regional uh, perfusion uh, using, um, using arterial spin labeling MRI. And uh, given that uh, if you have a CBF deficit, uh, it can have uh, two types of interpretations. That is, your neurons are functioning less efficiently and uh, it demands less blood flow to that region, or it's a vascular deficit. That is, uh, vasculature has uh, degraded capacity and function. And uh, that's why you don't, uh, uh, that's why it's not able to supply enough uh, blood to this particular region. So we decided to uh, tease apart this uh, interpretation conundrum by using uh, CVR or cerebrovascular reactivity to CO2 inhalation. Shown here are the participants. Uh, we had uh, 44 MCI participants uh, and uh, 28 elderly controls. Mean age was uh, same across the groups. The age range was also similar. Gender was approximately around the same range. Uh, education was similar. Uh, mini mental state exam scores were comparable between the MCI and the normal controls. So that signifies that, that the patients are at the early stage of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the, uh, the memory, uh, uh, logical memory uh, delayed and immediate recall scores and the other scores shown here in blue color were significantly lower in the MCI. Uh, patients compared to the elderly controls. And uh, as you can see, vascular measures were also similar across the groups. So uh, this signifies that they are at the early stage of Alzheimer's disease. To measure global CMRO2, we, we use the FIC principle, uh, uh, which, uh, 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 which classifies the difference between the, uh, the oxygenated blood flowing into the brain and the uh, uh, deoxygenated venous blood that's draining out of the brain. And this oxy, uh, oxygenated versus the deoxygenated blood difference uh, was obtained. Uh, this difference is calculated is, or is shown as YA minus YV, or is termed as the oxygen extraction fraction. Um, uh, so the uh, equation for CMRO2 is given here. It also uses CBF and, and a function called CA, which is the oxygen carrying capacity of blood. CBF in our uh, case was measured using phase contrast MRI. Uh, shown here is the imaging slice that is placed over the vertebral arteries and the internal carotid arteries. And uh, a phase contrast acquisition uh, uh, shows you the, the arteries in bright uh, uh, white color and the, uh, uh, and the rest of the background in, in grayish uh, scale. And uh, uh, computing the sum of the blood uh, across all these arteries gets you the total blood flowing to the brain. Uh, YA or the arterial oxygenation is calculated by connecting a pulse oximetry to the finger. YV is calculated using a novel method called venous oxygenation or T2 relaxation under spin tagging in which we place the labeling slab on, on the top half of the brain which, which labels or inverts the blood flowing out of the brain. That is the uh, the blood flowing into the sagittal sinus is labeled. Um, and then the imaging slice is placed over the sagittal sinus and, and along with the entire tissue, uh, tissue uh, shown here. Uh, we also acquire a control image. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a pair of images that's acquired, the control and the label. And when you subtract the two, you get the, uh, the tissue signal cancels out and you get the uh, blood signal from the sagittal sinus. Uh, as shown here, uh, over the multiple echo times. And you, uh, when you fit this uh, uh, over the different echo times, you get a T2 value for the, uh, the blood in the sagittal sinus. And there is a, a known relationship between T2 of blood and the, and the corresponding oxygenation. From that, we get the venous oxygenation in the, in the sagittal sinus blood. 
CA is uh, assumed from literature and uh, is, is shown here. Arterial spin labeling or, or measurement of cerebral blood flow is performed using ASL MRI, where we place the labeling slab in the, in the neck region, which labels the blood. That is, it inverts the blood flowing, the blood protons flowing into the brain. And uh, as you can see, the, uh, the, the negative arrow down here shows the, uh, the start of the, uh, the, uh, the labeled blood flowing into the brain. And over time, it undergoes T1 decay, and, uh, which you correct for in, in, on an individual slice basis in the, in the imaging slab uh, or, or the imaging slices. So after a delay, we acquire these images and you acquire the image of the tissue plus the tagged blood that's flowing into the, into the uh, brain tissue. In the control uh, scheme, uh, we do not apply the labeling blood, uh, like labeling slab. Instead, we just wait for a certain uh, for the same duration, and we acquire the uh, image of the tissue and the blood. And uh, the difference between the control and the label signal is is termed as the signal of the arterial spin labeling um, uh, 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 scheme. And um, you plug this equation, uh, plug this value into this equation, this kinetic model equation, and you obtain the cerebral blood flow in a, on a voxel-wise basis in the entire brain. Next, we uh, obtained uh, CVR to CO2 inhalation. But before I get into that, I guess uh, just I decided to provide a schematic of, of, a, um, of a brain of an animal uh, shown here in cast. And as you can see, the A, uh, a represents the arterial vessels, uh, which shows a ring-like structure around it. And these are the smooth muscle cells, which help it to uh, vasodilate in the presence of a vasodilative agent like CO2. At the same time, the venous vessels are, are devoid of these smooth muscle cells and, they, and uh, hence they are not able to vasodilate. So uh, as a CO2 or, or, or a vasodilative stimulus comes in, these, uh, these um, uh, ring-like structures cause it to relax and then bring in more oxygenated blood which is then captured by MRI using, uh, using uh, cold MRI or blood oxygenation level dependent MRI. So the uh, CVR scan is performed using a CO2 inhalation paradigm. Uh, we begin with a one minute of room air condition and alternated by a one minute of CO2 condition. And uh, this is repeated three times followed by one minute of room air condition. And uh, this was most easily tolerated by the patients. And that's why we decided to use it. Shown here is a schematic of the, of the patient lying on the bed. The CO2 gas is uh, provided in this Douglas bag, provided uh, to the subject using this gray tube. Subject is fitted with a mouthpiece and nose clip so that the subject breathes only the CO2 gas. Or there is uh, also a provision for room air, which, uh, in which case the regulator on the, on, uh, uh, there is a valve on this bag that switches between room air and CO2. Uh, the uh, the air mixture in the Douglas bag is 5% carbon dioxide, 21% uh, oxygen, and 74% nitrogen. We uh, continuously uh, uh, acquire bold MRI images during this uh, seven minutes period, and uh, end tidal CO2 or the uh, CO2 content in the lungs is also continuously monitored uh, during this entire seven minutes uh, experiment. And shown here in red is the end tidal CO2. Uh, 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 curve and the green shows the bold MRI time course. As you can see, the uh, from the brain. So the uh, this is the bold response or the response in the brain. Um, uh, the green curve is the response from the brain. Um, as you can see, the green curve is slightly delayed compared to the red curve, and um, this delay signifies the time it takes for the blood or the CO2 from the lungs to travel to the brain and cause a response and uh, uh, in the brain. Finally, when you uh, perform a li linear regression between the bold time course and the end tidal CO2 time course, you obtain a CVR map, uh, a regional CVR map in the units of percent uh, bold uh, signal change per millimeter mercury of CO2. So for the results, uh, the MCI patient showed a 12.9% reduction in, in uh, CMRO2 uh, in this group compared to the elderly controls. And, um, uh, it was significantly different. Uh, shown here also is a, the uh, scatter plot between CMR2 and logical memory delayed recall scores or long-term delayed recall scores. Uh, as you can see, the CMR2 is uh, positively correlated with long-term uh, recall. That is higher the CMR2 or the oxygen consumption uh, in the brain of an individual, higher is their uh, 
long-term memory scores. But this uh, uh, CMRO2 does not provide any spatial information. And uh, there are the voxel-wise CMRO2 mapping is, uh, is still at an earlier stage. And hence, we decided to use CBF as a surrogate marker for, uh, for regional assessment of, uh, of, of this uh, um, of cerebral blood flow. Shown here is, uh, is the deficit in CBF in MCI patients. So the MCI patients showed a decrease in CBF in this region. Uh, this reduction was about 11% compared to the control volunteers. Uh, this region is the precuneous and posterior cingulate region. Uh, it is a key region in the default mode network and is, uh, uh, is implicated or is shown to uh, be affected in Alzheimer's disease patients. It's a, it's a, it's a strong marker for a, a Alzheimer's disease uh, uh, prognosis. And uh, we also previously showed that sedentary elderly uh, uh, patient or sedentary elderly or people who do not exercise or have not exercised in their, their entire lives uh, show a reduction in CBF in the same region in the precuneous and posterior cingulate cortex uh, compared to athletes who have performed lifelong aerobic exercise or uh, elderly athletes. Um, so this interpretation of CBF can mean, uh, mean two things. Uh, that is, uh, one is neural dysfunction. That is the neurons in, the, in this region have, uh, are, are functioning less efficiently and, and so uh, demand less blood supply. And, and that's why there is CBF reduction in this region. Or there, is a there can be a vascular dysfunction. That is, blood uh, vessels uh, have lower uh, degraded capacity and carry less and, and carrying function. And can and may carry less blood to this region. And so, uh, please apart this, we we performed a CVR to CO2 inhalation. But um, shown here are this is this is the voxel wise CVR map in the controls and the MCI patients. As you can see visually, that uh, you know the CVR is similar across the controls and the MCI patients. <clears throat> We applied a mask of the CBF deficit region from the precuneous to posterior cingulate region. And we found that uh, CVR between the controls and the MCI patients was about similar and uh, was not different. So this uh, indicates that uh, vascular function was uh, indeed intact in the precuneous and posterior cingulate uh, region in these, in these patients. Um, so the CBF reduction uh, can be attributed only to uh, neural dysfunction. That is the neurons were functioning less efficiently and Hence, they demanded less blood, uh, blood flow to that region. <clears throat> so to summarize, uh, global CMR2 reduced, uh, was reduced in the uh, MCI patients by 12.9%. And uh, we also found a CBF deficit in the precuneous and PCC region. Um, CVR in this region was intact uh, in the MCI patients. And uh, so we believe and suggest that CBF deficit uh, may have a neural or metabolic origin in nature. And shown here are uh, um, O15-based uh, PET measurements of CMRO2. As you can see, most of the uh, brains of Alzheimer's type dementia patients show decreased uh, uh, CMRO2 when compared to control volunteers, um, and uh, especially the uh, posterior regions of the PCC um, um, is, is lower, is further lower in the Alzheimer's type dementia patients. With that, I will proceed to the uh, clinical trial, uh, assessing the long-term benefits of exercise um, in, these in these MCI patients. Um, so the uh, MCI is one of is, is the early stage of uh, Alzheimer's disease, and they stand uh, the MCI patients stand a very high risk of uh, cognitive and cognitive and physical decline to Alzheimer's disease. So the research is uh, typically focused in preventing this decline. Um, and so, uh, uh, given that the outcomes of uh, clinical trials are, uh, have, be, have been pretty negative, we decided to use alternative uh, methods. And um, uh, there are plenty other alternative methods like cognitive training, anti-inflammatory treatment, brain stimulation, et cetera. But we decided to focus on aerobic exercise. We believe that aerobic exercise is a low key or, or a, a low cost um, uh, and, um, and uh, effective method to prevent uh, cognitive decline in, in MCI. <clears throat> Shown here is a, is a meta-analysis by Hillman et al. who, uh, who compared uh, or who combined about 40 um, exercise trials uh, which used uh, exercise as intervention in elderly people. And um, 
exercise was shown to improve um, cognitive function in multiple domains uh, of, uh, of uh, cognitive function. Uh, in blue is the control group, that is the group that did not perform exercise, and the red is the exercise group. And as you can see, uh, most domains showed improvement in, uh, uh, in the exercise group, but uh, the highest uh, benefit was seen in executive function. Uh, uh, but but uh, the next main question is, what is the, um, what is the mechanism with which uh, exercise improves cognitive function? Uh, we have seen in aging literature that uh, exercise uh, increases the hippocampal size and it also improves uh, memory uh, function in, in, in the elderly. Um, exercise is also shown to increase uh, uh, cognitive function and, uh, and brain plasticity. Um, exercise is also uh, shown to preserve white matter integrity. And uh, uh, recently Chapman et al. showed that uh, cerebral blood flow uh, after 12 weeks of exercise was uh, preserved in this, uh, in this region. It, it is the anterior cingulate cortex region. Um, we also showed that um, um, elderly athletes have uh, preserved blood flow in the, in the precuneus and posterior cingulate cortex when compared to sedentary elderly controls. So the next natural question is, uh, are these benefits uh, evident in the MCI population as well? Um, in the MCI, we know so far that cardiorespiratory fitness improves after exercise. Um, a cognitive function is also shown to be improved in the MCI uh, patients. Um, um, recently, there was a paper that showed that spatial extent of fMRI activity reduced in a, in a memory retrieval task uh, with the um, understanding that less regions were, were recruited to perform uh, the same, um, uh, same task. Uh, but uh, Given that, uh, so, so I guess uh, the, um, the brain regions are functioning more e efficiently. Um, but we know that uh, fMRI activity is, uh, is a function of CBF, CBV, uh, or cerebral blood velocity, and CMRO2. But none of these have been measured in, 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 CMR, in the MCI patients. So, so we decided to uh, measure uh, MR, uh, MRI-based cerebral blood flow um, in, in these uh, patients before and after exercise for after one year of exercise. Shown here is the flow chart of the study. Uh, we, uh, we interviewed 1,620 participants out of which 1,450 got excluded for various reasons. 170 participants, MCI participants were consented. Um, uh, after that, about 100 uh, sort of were excluded for various reasons again. Uh, 70 got randomized uh, uh, to perform their uh, the baseline assessments. Uh, we performed uh, clinical assessments, cardiovascular assessments, neuropsychological, and uh, MRI-based uh, CBF and brain volume measurements. Uh, 39 participants got assigned to stretching and toning intervention, and 31 got assigned to the exercise or aerobic exercise intervention. Uh, out of these, again, um, 19 withdrew from the uh, stretching and toning group and 15 from the um, exercise, aerobic exercise. And uh, we were left with 20 participants uh, in the uh, stretching and toning and 16 participants in the, ex uh, in the aerobic exercise group. Again, the same post-intervention post assessments were performed. We then screened for quality of CBF data uh, and we had to take out uh, five subjects, uh, data from five subjects for poor quality uh, and one from the uh, aerobic exercise group. So eventually we were left with uh, 15 usable uh, data, uh, MRI data from uh, from both groups. This is again a simple schematic uh, showing that 15 uh, participant, MCI participants uh, underwent aerobic exercise and 15 stretching for one year uh, and uh, we measured cardiorespiratory fit fitness, cognitive function, uh, cerebral blood flow and bl uh, brain MRI in these participants before and after. <clears throat> So Dr. Tarumi has gone into this previously, but uh, I guess uh, this is a home-based uh, uh, training. We, we trained the participants in the lab to perform any forms of any form of uh, aerobic exercise as long as they maintain their heart range uh, within the 75 to 85% of the maximum. Um, uh, in, the, in the stretch and tone group, we, we trained them to, uh, to perform upper and lower body stretching exercises while maintaining their heart rate at the 50% of the, uh, uh, below the 50% of their max heart rate. The max heart rate was calculated in the, in the lab using, um, using um, VO2 max assessment. 
Um, and then um, after the initial training, they were allowed to go back home and, and perform the, uh, this training um, until, uh, for, for almost a year and uh, regularly report their uh, compliance to, to, our, uh, to the lab. Session uh, training started at three sessions per week, 30 minutes per session, and uh, uh, slowly the frequency was increased to four to five um, sessions per week and duration increased to 40 to 50 minutes per session. The, the number of days trained for, the, for both groups was not different. And the subjects wore heart rate monitors uh, and just for uh, assessment of compliance and uh, their training log was also maintained in the lab. Shown here are the baseline assessments of the two groups. The, the, uh, this shows that the, uh, the stretch, uh, the, the participants in the stretch and the exercise group were similar, the uh, same age range. Uh, the gender was also the same. Uh, we had same um, distribution that is eight males and seven females in each group. Education was matched, BMI was matched, uh, MMSE was also similar. Clinical dementia rate was the same. We also performed an amyloid imaging uh, paradigm uh, and found that amyloid status uh, between the two groups was also the same. Shown here are the VO2 max results. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, before the exercise uh, uh, values are shown in blue and after exercise are shown in red. On the left is shown the aerobic exercise group, on the right is shown the stretch group. As you can see, the aerobic exercise group sh showed a significant increase in VO2 max. And VO2 max is the, is, the, uh, is the oxygen consumption at peak exercise, which it gives an indication of the fitness level of an individual. So as you can see that aerobic exercise clearly increased the fitness of the, of the uh, people in, in this group, whereas the stretch group did not show any increase in fitness. Shown here is a group averaged cerebral blood flow map for the entire group, uh, that is the exercise group. Shown here is the difference between the, in the, between the pre and the post CBF map. So in the exercise group, we perform the post CBF minus the pre CBF and show, shown here is the difference in CBF in this group uh, in the, on the left. And as you can see the uh, cerebral blood flow in the anterior cingulate cortex region increased as well as in the hippocampus increased in the exercise, in the aerobic exercise group. Um, the ACC at the same time in the stretch group in this B panel showed a reduction in CBF and, um, and uh, either uh, the CBF was maintained or, or, or not as, as much, or, or maintained or not different uh, after the, after the um, uh, second time point in the stretch group. So clearly, uh, blood flow increased in the exercise group after one year of exercise in the anterior cingulate cortex and the, um, in, and the hippocampus. Uh, shown here is the blood flow in the hippocampus region. Uh, uh, as you can see, the exercise group showed a significant increase in the, in the hippocampal blood flow. Um, and after exercise, after one year of aerobic exercise, uh, a significant difference was not evident in the, in the stretch group. We were also interested in the anterior cingulate region because of uh, prior uh, uh, literature um, showing there were differences. And as you can see, the anterior cingulate region, uh, the difference in CBF uh, after one year of exercise, it shows that the aerobic exercise group had an increase in CBF in the anterior cingulate region, whereas the stretch group showed a reduction in CBF in that region. And uh, shown here are the long-term memory scores. Uh, so the participants were uh, read uh, uh, a paragraph of, uh, uh, of uh, content and they were asked to recall as much detail as possible after about half an hour of delay. And uh, this signifies a long-term recall in these patients. Uh, shown in blue are the pre-exercise values and in red are the, and the, uh, the post. On the left chart shows the aerobic exercise group and, the, and the, these, these numbers on the y-axis signifies the number of items correctly remembered uh, after, after the half an hour of delay from that paragraph that was read out to the subjects. As you can see, the, uh, the number of items correctly recalled after half an hour is significantly higher in the exercise group. And uh, we did not find any significant uh, difference in the, in the stretch group. And the... Uh, Post-exercise um, values that are shown here uh, are, are um, similar to what normal um, uh, folks would show um, and uh, uh, normal or, or age-matched healthy controls would show. 
Then we performed a correlation analysis, that is we performed voxel-wise correlation between uh, post minus the pre-CBF and uh, logical memory, post minus pre or, or delta C, or delta logical memory or long-term re delayed recall scores. As you can see, um, the, this region shows um, positive correlation, that is increase in memory correlated with increased blood flow in this, these regions. Uh, that is, uh, these regions are, are, are uh, show are, are the anterior cingulate cortex uh, or the Brodmann area 32, the medial, middle, and superior frontal uh, uh, gyrus, and uh, the, this is a critical uh, node in the in working memory, and um, it serves the function of monitoring of memory, and also allocation of attention uh, to memory, which uh, which also helps support memory. And shown here is a scatter plot of the same data. As you can see, that um, um, increase in CBF after uh, one year of intervention um, showed an increase in um, logical memory recall scores. Uh, the stretch is shown in blue, and they and then the exercise in red. And uh, as you can see, higher CBF um, um, relates or shows a positive uh, correlation with uh, increased delayed recall scores. We also assessed brain volume, that is we compared post minus pre brain volume and um, and we looked at major lobes in the brain and the hippocampus and the anterior cingulate cortex. We did not find any significant difference across groups. Um, uh, approximately a 1% reduction in, in brain volume was seen after one year of intervention. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to summarize aerobic exercise once was shown to uh, was suggested to show um, beneficial effects in the MCI patients. It improved it was shown to improve cardiorespiratory uh, function. It was shown to improve memory function. Uh, cerebral blood flow also increased in the anterior cingulate cortex and the hippocampus. And uh, the CBF increase in the anterior cingulate cortex correlated positively with uh, improved memory function. Uh, suggesting that uh, increase in CBF in this region may have caused an increase in uh, uh, increase in memory uh, function. We re we also received uh, press attention for this work recently, and uh, with that, I would like to thank um, uh, everyone who collaborated: um, uh, Rong Zhang, uh, Takashi Tarumi, Benjamin Cheng, Ben Levin uh, from the Institute of Exercise and Environmental Medicine. That's where all the exercise studies were performed. Uh, uh, Han Zhang Lu and Pei Ying Liu, who were at uh, UT Southwestern, who have moved on to um, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, all other collaborators at UT Southwestern and UT Dallas are funding agencies, and thank you all for your attention. And uh, I'll leave my contact in case you have any questions that are not answered here. And uh, I'll open for any questions. All right, thank you so much, Benny, for uh, uh, presenting very interesting uh, data. Um, okay, I, I think I have time for one question. Um, uh, okay, I have one question in chat um, from AJ Rosenberg. Okay, th uh, all right, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Have you assessed difference in the oscillatory pattern in your board signal between MCI and controls during your one minute on, one minute off uh, CBR to CO2 data? Uh, that's a that's a good question actually. So we have not assessed the oscillatory patterns. Uh, I, I think I will I will definitely look up on this and um, see if we can try to detect something in 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 our future work and see if there's something something promising that shows up. But uh, yeah, I have not looked at that. Okay. Um, all right. I, I'm receiving more questions. I, I really appreciate that because time is running. I, um, I'm i sorry, I have to move on. Um, Binu, you have more questions in the chat. So if you could answer. Yeah, be... I will look at it. Thank you. All right. So uh, the final talk will be uh, given by uh, Brittany Inzalt. Uh, she is a um, um, doctoral student from the Concordia, Concordia University in Canada. Uh, we really appreciate uh, she's uh, joining, you know, uh, contributing this seminar. She, she, her talk is very interesting comparing different modalities of cerebral uh, flow measurement on CBR. Okay, Brittany, uh, it's your, uh, please start. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you so much for the opportunity opportunity to be here. Um, I'm very excited to be giving this talk and to be speaking after such uh, incredible researchers in the field. 
Uh, so as Dr. Tarumi mentioned, I am a doctoral candidate and I'm super co-supervised by Drs. Claudine Gauthier and Louis Berer. Uh, so the title of my talk today is Cerebral Hemodynamics in Aging and the Effects of Fitness as Well as Obesity. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this as the previous speakers have already done a, a great job uh, indicating why our work is important. But as we all know, we're going to see a, a large increase in the number of older adults over the next decade. And we know that this is an issue because alongside um, aging, we see cognitive decline uh, that occurs quite commonly. And in fact, it has been reported that almost 50% of individuals over the age of 60 have some form of uh, cognitive decline, ranging from age-related to dementia. And this is going to present a large uh, increase in burden, not only to the healthcare system, but also to caregivers uh, due to the negative consequences of uh, cognitive declines, such as increased risk of falls, hospitalizations, as well as loss of um, independence. So what's interesting, though, is almost 50% of our population who is aged do not experience cognitive decline. And it makes us question why this is the case. What is it about those individuals who don't experience cognitive decline can we use to extend to those who might be experiencing it? So as has been a common theme throughout this series so far, physical activity, uh, physical inactivity is a uh, major risk factor, uh, or I should say a major modifiable risk factor for dementia risk, as is uh, obesity. So it's important to note that both of these uh, risk factors for dementia are also risk factors for vascular decline in aging. Now, we need to look to the vascular system to understand what occurs uh, during the aging process to increase the risk for dementia to better understand why physical activity and obesity might help to reduce this risk. So when we look at all of the outcomes related to vascular risk and cardiovascular disease, we see that aging in and of itself is an independent risk factor. And alongside aging, we see uh, risk factors like hypertension and obesity, which increase in prevalence alongside aging. So aging becomes this double-edged sword of sorts. And with these factors, as we know, comes a cascade of vascular, uh, comes a cascade of changes to the vascular system that lead to structural and functional changes. And these changes extend to the cerebral vascular system. And this presents uh, in numerous ways, but as we can see, uh, at the top part here, all of those vascular changes and remodeling eventually leads to the end organ effects that we can see in the brain, uh, most notably cerebral blood flow uh, declines, as well as uh, structural integrity and micro infarcts also occur. Now, these uh, changes are also seen, obviously, within the cerebral blood flow. And as we can see, given that aging itself is a risk factor for decline to cerebral blood flow, it makes sense that we would see uh, it, its decline over time as well. Now, the issue becomes, once we start to add risk factors to aging, we see a significant decline in this uh, slope. And when we start to add risk factors like, um, uh, excuse me, like physical inactivity, obesity, et cetera, we begin to see an even faster decline to CBF and eventually cognition. So our labs are interested in figuring out how can we maintain this curve into normal aging and what modifiable risk factors can we try to influence in other domains, or sorry, in other groups to ensure that we see this uh, trajectory continue to allow for healthy cognitive aging? So our lab concentrates on outcomes uh, of cerebral health that we think occur prior to the onset of cardiovascular risk factors. So I should say outcomes that are thought to decline prior to cardiovascular risk factors. And specifically, we uh, look at CBF and CBR. And we look at these measures specifically because uh, research has shown that they are more likely to be plastic and decline earlier 
than some of these structural changes. So this provides us with a unique opportunity to study biomarkers that could potentially be reversible. Um, so just uh, as a note for the rest of the talk, I will uh, only be discussing MRI results. Um, so thanks to Dr. Thomas, who already went over the difficult component of explaining ASL and CVR. So as we can see here, uh, we have a young adult, um, sorry, a CVF map for young adults and a CVF map for older adults. And we can see that the young adults have significantly greater cerebral blood flow as indicated by warmer colors uh, throughout the frontal regions, um, but also throughout the parietal regions. Now, uh, we know that CVR uh, is also able to measure flow in response to a vascular stressor, much like uh, CO2. And CVR has also been shown to be reduced in these regions as well, as we can see here. Uh, so as Dr. Thomas already went over, uh, we can measure CVR with ASL and BOLD. In our labs, we tend to look more at, uh, uh, we tend to measure them, I should say, at the same time. Um, and it's just it, how we collect our MRI sequences that we can look at them in this way. In any case, we can again see the same trends where the young adults on the left have significantly greater vascular reactivity indicated again by the warmer colors throughout the brain. And we can see that it's quite substantial again within the frontal and parietal regions. Now we don't only see this across age groups. We also see this within young adults or within aged older adults, where um, we see that individuals with Alzheimer's disease have significantly reduced vascular reactivity throughout their brain, but specifically within those frontal and parietal regions again. So there's clearly an assortment of negative consequences that can occur due to an aging vascular system that causes this deterioration of cerebral hemodynamics. But importantly, there is much evidence that exercise is capable of mitigating some of these adverse age-related complications. So, for example, work by Zimmerman and colleagues found that those individuals with um, greater fitness in aging had greater global cerebral blood flow, and they also had significantly greater blood flow within their frontal and parietal regions. So those same regions that are shown to decline uh, during aging. So it seems as though aging is able to potentially curb the negative, uh, sorry, fitness is able to curb the negative consequences of aging. And this has not just been found uh, in one study, it has been found quite consistently throughout the literature from a cross-sectional standpoint, but also longitudinally. Now, CVR is a little bit newer. Um, however, it has been, it has become an area of interest given that um, CVR is known to decline prior to CVF. So it could be a more sensitive biomarker of change in an aging brain. And if we take CVR to be a measure of uh, cerebrovascular health, we would expect then that in relation to fitness, we would see greater vascular reactivity with greater fitness. And this has been shown in numerous studies that greater fitness is related to greater CVR. Now, counterintuitively, if we take CVR to be a measure of cerebrovascular health, we some work has shown that greater fitness is related to decreased cerebrovascular reactivity. So the work that uh, Dr. Thomas has already discussed, as well as work from our own lab. So clearly the fitness literature suggests that there is an influence of exercise on cerebral hemodynamics, but it's likely more complex than uh, we previously thought. Um, so we wanted to take a, a deeper look at this and uh, use a comprehensive imaging approach to further understand this interplay a bit better. Um, so we published this work uh, two years ago in JCBFM. And as you can see, based on our title, we clearly found uh, these counterintuitive findings as well. So I'm gonna briefly take you through our methods and findings, and hopefully by the end, uh, convince you that maybe these findings are not as counterintuitive as previously thought. Uh, so again, much like Dr. Thomas already discussed in terms of 
hypercapnic manipulation. We use the same strategy. However, instead of one minute increments, uh, we use two minutes of rest of room air, followed by two minutes of a five millimeter uh, mercury increase of CO2 from the participants resting levels. And again, this is followed by another two minutes of rest, two minutes of hypercapnia, and two minutes of rest. So all participants underwent this while they were in the MRI, and we completed the dual echo scan of BOLD in ASL. And then on a separate day, all participants underwent a VO2 peak test um, under the supervision of a certified professional. So I will quickly take you through our demographics as well. So we had a young group of uh, adults who were between the ages of 20 and 30, and we had an older group of adults who were between the ages of 55 and 75. So you can see that they're all quite well educated. Um, and when we look to their VO2 peak, we can see that uh, both groups were quite uh, fit as determined determined by their VO2 peak. But in particular, when we looked at our older adult sample at an individual level, we found that many, uh, most of the participants, I should say, were above the 50th percentile for what we would expect for their age and sex. So they were quite a healthy group of older adults. Uh, I should also note that none of them were on any medication uh, whatsoever. Uh, so again, a very unique group to take a look at. So hopping right into our findings. So uh, here, the black dots and the black line represent our young adults and the blue dots and the blue line represent our older adults. Um, this is the last time we will see the young adults um, as the priority of this uh, talk and study was more on aging. So we did um, complete Z scores for all of these outcomes as we wanted to take into account age, education, and sex for both groups. And for the older adults, we specifically wanted to take into account white matter, white matter hyperintensities, as well as the Framingham risk factor score, which is a measure of um, cardiovascular risk. Uh, and we did this because we know that both of these outcomes influence uh, cerebral hemodynamics. So when we take a look at our gray matter uh, volume results, we can see that individuals with greater fitness had greater gray matter volume. Um, and this is exactly what we would expect based on the literature. Now, when we look at our resting CVF results, we didn't see any significant relationship between fitness and CVF. And of course, when we move on to our bold CVR results, we see that those with greater fitness had a decreased bold CVR. And this was also present when we looked at CVF, CVR. So Dr. Thomas's group did find this um, in their master athlete study, as he already presented earlier. Um, but given that our sample was not master athletes, they were very fit, but they were not the same comparison. Um, we wanted to take a deeper look into the regions uh, to see if they matched uh, the work by Dr. Thomas and to see exactly what was happening within these regions in terms of other MRI findings. So when we looked at the regions that were statistically significant, we found that they were quite global within the gray matter of the brain. So all the areas in blue are the regions that were statistically significant in relationship, or sorry, uh, for the inverse relationship between CVR and fitness. So we extracted the information from uh, this uh, from these regions, and although we didn't see gray matter volume was statistically significant, uh, it does look like it was trending. Now, surprisingly, we did see that resting CDF within these regions were, was inversely related to fitness as well as CBF cdr So we originally thought that perhaps these results were being driven by the more fit individuals having higher CBF. So this allowing them uh, to not increase their blood flow as much to the CO2 uh, inhalation. So almost like a a ceiling of effect, um, but this clearly was not the case. So we wanted to take a look at how the bold signal responded to the hypercapnic challenge. So we completed a fear analysis and we split our older adults fitness level up into five groups. The first group uh, in one were uh, older adults with uh, the lowest fitness level. 
and bin five were our older adults with the highest VO2 peak. And as we can see on the graph here, our older adults that had the highest, uh, sorry, the highest fitness level um, had the slowest slope in the upswing of the response as well as the least response uh, to the hypercapnic challenge in their percent bold signal change. So again, this was very surprising. Uh, this is not at all what we expected. Um, so we had to take a step back and try and piecemeal together everything that we looked at. And what we came up with were a few physiological explanations. So the slower bold response to hypercapnia really gave us a sense of Perhaps there was um, some CO2 desensitization occurring or impaired chemosensitivity. So in the work by Dr. Thomas and colleagues, they do indicate that perhaps um, a lifetime of exposure to higher CO2 levels would disallow participants or uh, to see uh, as much of an increase in CO2 levels because uh, their response is attenuated. So this seemed like it could be a likely uh, mechanism to explain our results. Again, as I already discussed, the pre-dilation didn't seem likely as a response given that our more fit individuals had decreased um, cerebral blood flow. And then taking what we know about uh, the uh, we looked to the athlete literature to try and understand a bit more what could be occurring in the brain. And of course, uh, we, kind of, we started to investigate autoregulation. And we know that in young athletes, as well as mass, master athletes, that autoregulation is impaired at rest and during exhaustive exercise. So we hypothesize that maybe um, there's a mixture of things happening in our healthy group of uh, older adults who were more fit, where their autoregulation was potentially impaired. And if this is the case, they would not be able to respond as fast or as much to the hypercapnic challenge. So this is one, uh, two, I guess, explanations that we had from a physiological standpoint. And then when we took a look at the previous literature to try and see what the differences were in protocols um, and outcomes, we realized that, the that all of the studies that looked at, um, that found CVR was related to uh, fitness in terms of a positive relationship, they were all measured with uh, TCD, whereas all of the studies that found an inverse relationship between CVR and fitness were measured with BOLD. So given that TCD reflects more cerebral blood flow velocity in major cerebral arteries, and BOLD is a mixture of blood flow, blood volume, and oxidative metabolism, and the signal tends to be determined more from a from the venous side of um, the, the vascular system, it's possible that they're perhaps reflecting different vascular compartments and properties that are being imaged. Um, so to our knowledge, there's not been a study that has actually um, investigated TCD, CBR, and compared it to bold CVR. Uh, so it's possible that we can't actually compare them um, because they may not be related. However, um, future work should try to look at this to parse apart this relationship and gain a better understanding of what uh, the differences between TCD, CVR, and bold CVR are uh, to gain a better understanding of what exactly we're looking at. So quickly changing gears here, um, I did mention at the beginning that obesity is also a risk factor for dementia. And this makes sense as obesity is associated with a cascade of changes to the vascular system in part caused by uh, inflammation. And when we look to the cerebral hemodynamic literature in terms of obesity, as we can see on this left figure, individuals with obesity compared to their lean counterparts had significantly reduced cerebral blood flow. And this, again, makes sense if we think of the negative cascade of uh, events that occur in or to an individual's vascular system who has obesity. Now, uh, recent work by Silva and colleagues also found the same where individuals uh, with obesity had lower cerebral blood flow in the regions indicated in blue. 
However, they found that the individuals with obesity had significantly greater perfusion as well than their lean counterparts in the red regions here. Now, this calls into question what is happening in some of these obese individuals. What could a mechanism for these uh, counterintuitive findings be? And recent work out of Dr. Barrer's lab might give us an indication of what exactly is happening here. Where they brought in two groups of older adults, one was considered non-obese and the other group was considered obese uh, based on body composition measures. Now, all participants underwent a VO2 peak test, and then based on this, the individuals with obesity were uh, uh, separated based on a median split by their VO2 peak. And what uh, we found in this study was that those higher fit obese individuals had significantly better short-term memory and executive function than their lower fit counterparts. And in fact, they were not statistically different from the, their non-obese uh, individuals either. So this then brings into the question, can cardio cardiovascular fitness offset the negative effects of obesity on cerebral hemodynamics? Now, I don't have the answer for you today, um, but I will let you know that this is a very active field that our labs are looking at. And I think it's a, an important field, obviously, that we should all be incorporating, regardless of the vascular risk factors that uh, we are looking at. So I just want to thank everyone today for your time, as well as both my labs and uh, everyone for who organized this. So thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Brittany. Uh, these are very interesting data uh, comparing you. the different methodology of uh, CBX measurement during CO2 reactivity. That's that's really uh, interesting. Okay. I I have questions for you from Phil Ainsley in your okay. chat. Um, let me see. Dr. Ainsley, if you want to speak up, you can, you can. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm actually just reading this right now. And I, I completely agree with uh, your third point there that we perhaps don't have enough evidence that higher CVR is better than low CVR. Uh, this is kind of a route that uh, we have been talking about in our lab for a while. Um, and it brings, I think, into question what exactly are we measuring uh, with CVR and MRI? Um, so I, th I think we just, uh, we need to have perhaps a better understanding of what it is in a larger sample of individuals, um, perhaps with ranging fitness levels and other outcomes to figure out what does this vascular reactivity mean? Um, for the carotid stenosis, we did not screen for this uh, to my recollection. Uh, however, that's a great point that um, this could be influencing results as well. So thank you. Any other questions? You know, I, I, I uh, okay, all right, here is, uh, okay. Uh, great talk uh, from Keith uh, Lawrence. Did you look at the CBL measurements from ASL since you were using the dual echo sequence? Yes, we did. And we saw the exact same trends as bold CVR. Um, so we're, you know, we're not just seeing it from the bold side, but we are seeing it from a flow side that CVR was reduced in our older adults with higher fitness. Mm -hmm. So again, I think it just warrants for further study and, uh, I think more outcomes potentially. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, okay. Well, one, one question or comment from me, maybe, have you measured blood pressure during the, the activity measurement? Because I'm saying this because these old and young people have, may have a different, you know, pressure uh, reflex. Uh, to yes. And then uh, yeah. Absolutely. This is uh, also another area that we are quite interested in looking at. It gets a little bit harder once we involve uh, MRI because, you know, the, the cord is outside and yeah. it calls into question the validity of the blood pressure during the scan. Um, however, I, I think it's very relevant and uh, 
I, it definitely needs to be looked at, and I think it could partially help answer some of the auto regulation components as well. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, but these data are really uh, important, you know. Compared yes. To so yeah, that's that's great work. Yeah, for you. Um, uh, does do the audience have any question for Brittany or um, uh, other talks, um, including uh, me, Vinu, or Tsubasa? Um, well, I don't see any questions coming in chat anymore, but um, um, if you have questions to any of the speakers today, I think you can um, email or I think you're uh, free to contact us. Um, and again, thank you so much for joining. And okay, I, I can see Patrick face now. So maybe I can hand over to uh, Patrick and- uh, Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Takashi. And uh, Karen and I would like again to thank uh, all the speakers for uh, high quality talks. Uh, again, amazing inf uh, amount of information and great discussion with the, with the audience. So uh, I will just take this opportunity to invite you uh, to the next um, seminar, which will be a point counterpoint type seminar. Uh, so it's especially in, Related to the to the last talk and and what Brittany said, uh, I think we we still not necessarily know what we are really measuring. So uh, in the red corner of this uh, point counterpoint, we'll have Dr. Ryan Orland, who's a postdoc fellow uh, at UBC, and in the uh, blue corner, we'll have a double team with, with uh, Dr. Sam Lucas and Dr. Karen Mollinger, who will discuss. Uh, about uh, so the, the the topic will be cerebral vascular reactivity. What are we measuring? So uh, make sure to uh, to register to this um, to our next seminar, who who will uh, be held on April eighth. So again, thank you very much, and uh, have a good day, evening, and night.